If you have to physically remove yourself from tempting situations, then do it. When Potiphar's wife tempted Joseph, he left his coat and ran away. Sometimes you may have to leave your coat, get out of the situation, run from it, don't stick around. When you're tempted, get up and change the situation you're in. Change the TV channel. Turn on the music, turn off the music. Go for a walk, read the Bible, or call a fellow Christian. Do something. When, tempt when temptation calls you on the phone, don't try to argue. Just hang up and go do something else. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we thank you so much that we can come together this morning to, to worship you. And Lord, we just pray that we'll take these words of wisdom to our hearts and, and to realize that we live in a world full of temptation that we run across every single day, no matter who we are. And Lord, we just thank you that you're there to provide a way out as your word is promised. And we just pray that we would follow you and, and, and bring glory to you and all that we do be that shining light to a lost and dying world. Lord, we pray for our service today uh, that we would just bring honor and glory to you as we lift up the name of Jesus. In his sweet name we pray. Amen. All right, you can remain seated as we open our hymnals to page 559. We're going to sing the first and last verse of Rescue the Parish.
if you're wondering why I look kind of like a bum, uh, I left my clothes at my college, so. Hugging on me and kissing on me and so forth, but 
But for God to teach you real love, He's going to put you around some unlovely people. So this morning we want to look at what we're going to call special cases. These are people that we call VDP. VDP stands for Very Draining People. You're going to recognize every one of them when we mention them. Uh, these are four special case, cases. There are difficult people. There are demanding people. There are disappointing people. And there are destructive people. You have all four of these in your life, and you will throughout your life. God says, I want you to learn to love these people too in the way that's best for them and in the way that God wants you to do it. So first of all, difficult people. We're going to give a brief description of all four, and then we're going to come back and, and talk about all four a little bit more in depth. Difficult people, that's the easy one. You know who those are. They're just people who are just hard to work with. They're hard to get along with. Uh, they seem to be unpleasable. They're cranky. They can be irresponsible. They can be immature. They can have personality defects. The lights are on, but nobody's home. The elevator doesn't go all the way to the top. A few, fry, a few fries short of a happy meal. They're just not all there. They can... They may be a little deficient in social skills, but one of the primary characteristics of difficult people is they're, they're typically rude. Uh, they're just rude. They can be obnoxious. It's hard to love obnoxious people. Another one is demanding people. We all know who demanding people are. They have an agenda. They're aggressive. They're pushy. Whenever you're around a demanding person, you almost you always feel a little manipulated. It's like they want it their way and it's got to be right. And they tend to be insistent. They tend to be stubborn. They tend to think they're always right. They can be very self-centered because they're not thinking about anybody else. They can be demeaning. It's my way or the highway. Oftentimes they will they expect perfect perfection out of you. Demanding people are pushy people. And then disappointing people. Disappointing people. These people don't always mean to hurt you, but sometimes they they actually they, sometimes they're actually well intentioned, but they disappoint you. They just let you down. Maybe they break promises that they say they'll keep or they fail you in some way or another. Or it could be more serious than that. Uh, disappointing people could be unfaithful to you. Disappointing people could be disloyal to you. Uh, they can break vows that they've made to you. You're going to have disappointing people in your life and you have to learn how to love them in the way that God wants you to love them. The most difficult of all are the destructive people. The destructive people. These people want to harm you. Uh, they're intentional. It's sad to say, but there is evil in this world. And they are, there are hateful people, and there are people who are double-dealing, who are deceitful, who mean to harm you. They can be deadly. They can be disingenuous. They can be dangerous. They can be debilitating. But they're, they're in your life. They're destructive people who hurt you, who harm you, who wound you. So how do you respond in love to each of these groups of people? We see the answer in the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. We've talked about this for several weeks now. Go home and read the whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. But in verse 5 it says, love is not rude. Love does not demand its own way. Love is not irritable. And love keeps no record of when it has been wrong. When you understand these four types of people, you begin, or these type four things, you begin to build them into your life. You graduate from the bachelor's degree of love to the master's degree level of love. So number one, the first type of VDP, very draining people, that you're going to have to learn to deal with in life and learn to love are difficult people. Have you noticed that there are a lot of them? Uh, they're all over. Have you noticed that the world tends to be, 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 
be becoming more rude, not more civil. Uh, people are increasingly rude. Uh, you can find rudeness everywhere, in school, at work, in restaurants, in stores, on the freeway, all around. So how do you respond in love to difficult people? The Bible says love is not rude. So number one, if you're taking notes, number one, I must be tactful, not just truthful. I must be tactful, not just truthful. Love is tactful. In other words, you don't return their rudeness. You overcome evil with good. When people are difficult, you don't be difficult by One of the ways that you can be tactful is simply by listening to them. Uh, they may have a point. If you listen to people sympathetically and then you respond tactfully, that is the loving response to a difficult person. You listen lovingly and then you respond lovingly. Uh, this thing about listening really goes with tact because the number one form of rudeness in our society today, I'm guilty of this every single day of my life, you are too, is interrupting people. Not listening. It's rude not to listen. It's rude to not let somebody finish their sentence. I do this all the time. My, my, my brain runs fast and I think I know what people are going to say and I answer back, that's not good. Proverbs 18, 13 says, answering before listening is both stupid and rude. So this concludes today's sermon. Go and do likewise. Just kidding. Everybody does this. We're rude because we jump to conclusions. We, we assume we know what other people think. No tact is listening. Love listens and then love responds tactfully, not just truthfully and not interrupting. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 says, Stop being bitter and angry and mad at each other. Don't yell at one another or curse each other or ever be rude. Instead, be kind and merciful and forgiving. Forgiving others just as God forgave you because of Christ. Love listens and love is tactful. Notice it says don't yell at one another. Anybody ever do that? Yeah, and, and don't lie too. Don't, don't curse at each other. Profanity requires zero intelligence. Uh, it requires no IQ. You, you can teach a parrot to curse. Profanity is no sign of intelligence. In fact, it's a sign you can't think of a better word at that point. Now, I have a pet peeve I'm going to share with you uh, in this regard, and then we'll move on. When people curse, don't laugh. I, I, I've been complaining about this for 20, 30 years. I, you sit in a group of Christians, and somebody lets a curse word slip, or either they do it on purpose, and everybody laughs. And I just get angry. I think, don't encourage it. All you're doing is encouraging it. It's not funny. Some people who say, I just speak my mind. I just tell it like it is. And they're proud of that. Actually, telling it like it is is not the best way to communicate. Uh, a lot of times, frankness is honestly just rude. You need to ask yourself, why am I saying it this way? Am I saying it so that I can let off steam? Or am I saying it really for the benefit of the other person? Proverbs 16, 21. A wise, mature person is known for his understanding. The more pleasant his words, the more persuasive he is. Uh, the more pleasant you are, the more persuasive you are. Uh, write this down. I'm never persuasive persuasive when I'm abrasive. You're never, I'm never persuasive when I'm abrasive. Nagging just doesn't work. Just ask my wife. The way you say something, I'm just joking. The way, the way you say something determines the way it's received. If you say it offensively, it's going to be received defensively. And that's why love is all about your words. We talked about last week. It's all about tact. It's being truthful. You're not lying about it, but it's saying it tactfully. 
being tactful, not just truthful. Number two, the second kind of group that you're going to have to deal with is demanding people. These are the people who always want their way. Uh, they're always, they've always got a right way and a wrong way to do it, and your way is always the wrong way. Yeah, you, you, you can never quite please them. They've got their standards, and if you don't meet their standards, they're going to let you know about it. How do you respond in love to demanding people? 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Love does not demand its own way. So number two, I must be understanding, not demanding. I must be understanding, not demanding. Jesus is the best example of this. We always look at Jesus as our example. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7 says, Your attitude, your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ had. Though he was God, he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. He made himself nothing. He took the humble position of a slave and appeared in human form. He was understanding, not demanding. Anytime you hear somebody saying, I have my rights, that's all you hear these days, I have my rights. They're being demanding, not understanding. One of the greatest tests of your character is how you treat the people who serve you. Think about this for a minute. The waiters and the waitresses, the people at fast food places, the, the male person, the secretaries, employees, even doctors, nurses, people who work with you. How do you treat the people who help you out? Do you even notice them? Do you even know their name? It's treating people with respect, and, and you be understanding, not demanding. Uh, around the world, Americans are known as, as they have a, Americans have a pretty bad reputation for being demanding. Uh, we are considered to be a very demanding group of tourists. Americans want it their way, and they want it their way now. The secret of great service is simply respect people. If you, if you, People are actually respected. They do their job and nobody's even looking at them. Nobody's paying attention to them. Nobody's considering their feelings. Nobody's sympathetic of what they're going through. Nobody respects them. So here's my homework for you this week. I want you to practice being understanding, not commanding. If you go out to eat lunch after church this afternoon or you go to a store, be understanding, not demanding, realizing that that clerk may have had a tough time. That they may have just gotten chewed out by their boss or something. Waiting on the public is hard. Practice being understanding, not demanding. You know, the best place to practice it, how about home? How about at home? Uh, sometimes we're more polite to strangers than we are to the people in our lives. Sometimes we say, the meanest things, the most unthoughtful things to the people that we love the most are families. Titus 3.2 says, Believers shouldn't curse anyone or be quarrelsome, but they should be gentle and show courtesy to everyone. What is courtesy? Courtesy is a dying trait in this society. Uh, courtesy is showing love in the little things. That's what it is, showing love in the little things. You be kind to people. Uh, a lot of marriages die from a lack of courtesy. That may sound strange, but if you think about it, the things that you used to do for each other, you don't do anymore. The little niceties, the thoughtful things, the notes, the cards, the flowers, the calls, the courtesies, opening the door, let me get that for you, not get it yourself, just, just a lack of courtesy. So how do you be more understanding of people who are demanding in your life? Luke 6.31 says, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's called the golden rule. It's being understanding, not demanding. Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. Now what happens with demanding people? Does that mean I'm supposed to just let them run over me? Do I just let them push me around? Do I just act like a doormat? Just always cave in and let them have their way? No. 
Absolutely not. Here's the key. Be tender without surrender. Be tender without surrender. You don't just let people push you around. Jesus never caved into manipulators. The religious leaders, the Pharisees, always tried to manipulate Jesus. They were extremely demanding. They were very legalistic. They had all kinds of demands that they themselves couldn't even keep. Jesus would not let other demanding people push him into a corner. But you can be tender without surrender. That's what you call love and action. Number three, there's a third group that we have to deal with, and that is disappointing people. Disappointing people. You're going to be disappointed in life. I don't think that's a shock to you if you if you've lived very long at all. In fact, everybody in your life is going to disappoint you. Your friends are going to disappoint you, your family, your parents, your brothers, your sisters, they're going to disappoint you. Your husband or your wife is going to disappoint you. Your pastor is going to disappoint you. Why? Because nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. So how do you deal with disappointing people? How does love respond when we're disappointed by people? 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Love is not irritable. Love is not irritable. So I must be gentle, not judgmental. I must be gentle, not judgmental. Let's see what the scriptures have to say about how we can be gentle and not judgmental. In Galatians 6, 1. Says, brothers and sisters, if someone in your group does something wrong, you who are spiritual, to go to that person and gently, circle the word gently, gently help make him right again. But be careful because you might be tempted to sin too. I love the fact that it says gently. How do you have tough conversations with people in a gentle way? How do you confront people you love when you uh, see they're doing something they shouldn't be doing? The Bible tells us you've got to do it gently, not harshly. Not in a rude or a mean way, uh, but do it with gentleness and respect. Here's a little equation, equation I ran across that says this. Right plus rude equals wrong. Think about that. Right plus rude equals wrong. It doesn't matter if you're right. If you're rude about it, nobody's going to care what you have to say. They're immediately going to get defensive. So, so you do it in a gentle and loving way, not a, in a harsh or a cruel way. Romans 14, 12. Each of us will give account of himself to God. Not to each other, but to God. Therefore, let's stop passing judgment on each other. It's important to understand the difference between using your judgment and being judgmental. Think about that. A difference between being, using your judgment and being judgmental. People will let all kinds of things go on in relationships and say, well, I don't want to be judgmental. So instead, they just become victims. Now, there's a difference between using your judgment and being judgmental. You've got to use your judgment so you can see when something's going wrong. There's nothing wrong with doing that. You've got to be able to decide between wrong and right. To be able to know what the truth is. But the truth is not judgmental. It's only judgmental when you beat somebody over the head with it. That's when it becomes judgmental. When you start determining what their sentence is going to be. The Bible says you've got to use your judgment. You've got to be smart about things. But you don't have to be judgmental with people. Proverbs 15, 4. Gentle words bring life and health. A deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. The message paraphrase says it this way. Kind words heal and help, but cutting words wound and maim. So we always have a choice when we need to speak to somebody, especially with our kids, with young kids or grandkids. Have you ever noticed how cutting words can just wound and maim a child? They, they, you can hurt them for life. But the Bible says that kind words 
are words that will heal and help. So when your kids mess up, you don't have to get on their case and tell them whatever you think they are at the moment, but give them a vision of how things could be. Speak words of life and health and hope into them, not words of judgment and harshness, but be gentle. It's the same way in our marriages. How many marriage problems could be strengthened if we had just waited 10 seconds? Just, just use words that were gentle and kind and not harsh or vindictive. There are really so few things that are worth fighting about if you think about it. Now let me tell you something about that 10 second rule. The 10 second rule does no good whatsoever if you just wait 10 seconds and then go ahead and say it. Probably will add to it, make it worse. But even the little things that we think are worth fighting about, most of them aren't worth fighting about either. They're just temporary. They're going to pass. We ought to learn to cut each other some slack and be kind and gentle in our relationships. I mean, did, did the Lord cut us some slack? You better believe it. <laughs> over and over, probably every single day. Number four, the fourth aspect has to deal with destructive people, dealing with destructive people. This is the hardest one of all. How do you love people who intentionally hurt you? Who are mean, who are hateful, who are manipulative. When people hurt us, we have two natural tendencies. Remember it and retaliate. Remember it and retaliate. First, we remember it. We stockpile it in our mind and we we put it back in the database and we say, I'm never forgetting that one. I'm never letting them off the hook. I'm going to watch them from now on and we remember it and we rehearse it over and over and over in our minds. The second thing we do is we retaliate. We want to get even. But that's not what the Bible says. Love takes a step up. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Love keeps no record of wrong. So what does that mean? How do I respond to the people who have hurt me in my life? How do I handle all those wounds, those pains, those hurts that I've stockpiled back there in my memory? Here's what you do. You don't repeat it, you delete it. You don't repeat it, you delete it. Wipe it out of the memory frame. Let it go, forget it, and get on with your life. Don't repeat it. What do we mean by that? Typically, when we get hurt, we repeat it in three ways. We repeat it emotionally in our minds. We repeat it relationally as a weapon. And we repeat it practically and verbally in telling other people. First, we repeat it in our mind by going over and over and over in our mind. We rehearse it. Every time you remember it and rehash it and rehearse it, and go over it again in your mind, you get hurt again. And that's not smart. Resentment only perpetuates the pain. It never heals. It never solves anything. The second way we repeat it is we repeat it in fights and relationships. We use it as wedges, as weapons. You did this, but you did that. Uh, remember when you did that, but you, you, but you did this. You, you pile it all back up again. The third way we repeat it is we repeat it to other people. We talk to others. That's called gossip. We tell everybody else. We don't talk to God about it. We don't talk to the person that we need to talk to about it. We talk to everybody else about the pain. We, we want to try to line up people on our side so that we're better. And they're bad and they're hated as much by other people as they're hated by you. Unfortunately, you see this a lot of times in, in church squabbles. All three of those are destructive and damaging and self-defeating. Uh, you're only hurting yourself by repeating it in your mind, by repeating it over and over again in conversations and, and using it as a wedge and by repeating it to other people. Don't repeat it. Delete it. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Mark 11, 25. Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him 
and let it drop. Leave it. Let it go. In order that your Father who is in heaven may also forgive you your own failings and shortcomings and let them drop. Somebody says it's been too long. I've carried this hurt for years and years and years, maybe even decades. It's just too late. You're wrong. Proverbs 10, 12 says, Hate stirs up trouble, but love forgives all offenses. It says all offenses. Uh, which of the offenses in your life are you still holding on to? Proverbs 19, 11 says, When someone wrongs you, it is a great virtue to ignore it. Just ignore it. Let it go. But you can't ignore it until you first face it and forgive it. Then you can ignore it and you let it go. Love lets it go. That's the title of our message today. Love lets it go. Job 18.4 says, You are only hurting yourself with your anger. 1 Corinthians 13, 5, this is your memory verse for this week. Love doesn't keep a record of, a record of wrongs. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. I don't know who you need to forgive, but I, knew, I do know this. Today is the day. Today is the day. As we close, I want you to think of the people who have hurt you in your life, and I want you to let them off the hook. Love lets it go. Love forgives. Because they deserve it? Absolutely not. Most of the time, no. You, you don't deserve being forgiven either by God. But because it's the right thing to do, and it's the only way to be free. Dear Holy Father, we thank you so much for uh, your precious Word of God that we can look into and that touches on every single subject, every... Uh, circumstance that we run across in life. And Lord, I know that there's people here this morning if they're breathing, they've been hurt. All of us have been hurt many, many times, Lord. And I just pray that you'll just wrap your loving arms around each one of us, Lord, and just help us to realize that you've forgiven us and you love us no matter what, and we should do the same to others. And Lord, we just thank you for your love. Thank you that we can love others the way you loved us, because if we're saved, if we're trusted in Christ as our Savior, then you've given us the Holy Spirit to live within us, to, to lead us and guide us and show us how to love others, that even those that have hurt us. So we just pray that we would be a more loving people within our families, within our congregation, within our communities, that we might be a shining light for you. And we just pray for our invitation for your will to be done. In Jesus' sweet name we pray. Amen. Will stand with me as we see our invitational hymn on page 294. Have that no way, Lord.
My first prayer request is all about love, Miss Mildred. Uh, she texted me, when we've emailed, Facebook messages on Facebook, and all week long. Did. She called me last night, and um, she just wants me to make sure that all of y'all know she loves you. And she missed it. She's at Penny's house, I think, for another week or two. But hopefully she's going to get back to church before long. She's really, really had a rough time. But she just... Hopefully this week, man, okay? But you know she loves you. And uh, so she want to make sure that we get... I talked with Jean Wallace also. She... Someone told me on Wednesday that Dean had really been down in her back that she was going to have an epidural. And I thought it was in the future, but when I called her Friday, I think it was, she, she already had it, and it really helped a lot. So, hopefully she'll be back before long as well. Um, Buddy's sister, Nellene, I, I want to share with you that the reason she's wearing a mask is she, she helps with a, a cancer patient. Um, her son's girlfriend has cancer and so she has to be real careful being around her helping her she's a caregiver so so we need to pray for her name what is her name again sharon taylor sharon taylor if you would remember sharon taylor in your prayer um who else do we need to pray for okay. your son-in-law larry bassett is anyone who's working for your mom um, Hattie's co-worker that we've been praying for for months that had cancer passed away this week, Stephanie Frommer. I think she was what, 56? Had children and husbands to pray for that family. Um, any other prayer request we got? Uh, October the 9th. Marvin's going to finally do it. <laughs> we were giving them a hard time about it. Now this probably goes back to his days of wrestling. I don't know. We, we, my hips hurt too. We know wrestle. But, but we'll be October 9th. So we, you're going to be out for a few weeks probably. Hopefully not long. Like not too long. We can't get by without any of y'all. So, uh, anybody else before we turn it back over to Levi? Taryn's going back home tomorrow. Um, Taryn came up from Florida because a friend of hers and her mom's, uh, Sarah, her mom, a friend of theirs, committed suicide this week. Uh, so pray for that thing. Taryn went to another church this morning instead of our church with a new boyfriend. So I, we got to check that out. Sing the benediction alongside me. Praise him, all you little children.